in the last hour, the plan is that John Blake and I will first of all listen as the small group um, leaders or their designates stand up and give us brief summaries of what they heard. <laughs> oh, did you hear me say that? A brief summaries of what you heard in groups. And I think the best thing to do will be to go in order um, as people are listed in, the, in the, the bulletin. That way I won't be calling names. Then John and I are going to take turns, each of us, briefly saying some things that we heard today and what we thought about what we heard today. And then we'd like to wrap up with some pop-ups from you. And the lead question will be, what shifted for you today? What shifted for you? And brief is, for all of these, the key adjective so that we hear from as many people as possible. So I'll begin then by inviting Professor Edmund to come up, or your designate. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Edmund. I'm an assistant professor of sociology here at Piedmont. And uh, I, I feel so inspired by all of the talks today and uh, especially by our group discussions. It was intimate. It was definitely full of stories and narrative. Um, what I, what struck, struck me the most was this, uh, this intersection of stories from people who had experienced the first civil rights movement, so people who had firsthand experience of what that looked like and the experiences that they had um, growing up during that era. And then also individuals who continue to have personal experiences now um, during what many have termed, as I heard today, and I like, I'm going to steal it, the second civil rights era. Um, I, I wish I could hit all of the points that we covered because they were many and diverse and wonderful. Um, something that we started off talking about was the importance of definition and how definitions help shape our realities and thus shape the actions that we uh, see as possibilities. So how do we define racism and race and racial bias and prejudice? Um, uh, one of the individuals in, in the, the discussion group pointed out that we tend to talk about privilege as something that uh, is not a right and that that may be uh, not the most strategic way of thinking about that. So if we think about privilege as part of racial inequality, what are the rights that some parts of our society aren't having equal access to health care, education, um, a fair justice system. Um, so I, I really appreciated that foray, foray into uh, thinking about how we define these important, um, these important points. Uh, we also talked about how, mo how to move from the inter internal to the external, which was something that Dr. Perry pointed out as uh, an, a, a, an essential process that needs to take place. So some ideas that emerged from the discussion were, were uh, picking one thing and doing it with your whole being, which I think is something that Dr. Perry definitely uh, suggested. Uh, another theme I saw was living it, being intentional in day-to-day -day, uh, activities to place those uh, ideas of racial equality into movement, things like putting your kids in public schools or pulling your money out of corporations that have uh, racist uh, policies or outcomes. Get political was something that also emerged as important. The importance to educate, to find opportunities to educate others about these important, uh, important points. And uh, something that uh, came from, from Lillian Smith herself, and I was very uh, glad that someone brought this up, was that we can't become comfortable. We can't stop uh, bringing up questions of bias and, and racial inequality, that we have to keep hurting continually in order to move forward in the process. And then finally, uh, that this was not one of my questions, but one of the, the discussion uh, members brought this up, and I thought it was a wonderful one to hit on. But if you had to pick one cause to dedicate yourself to, what would that be? And uh, we had uh, a few different ones emerge. Um, one was uh, working against the death penalty and the prison industrial complex, and 
interwoven into that issue is uh, the, the racial injustice that we have in the criminal justice system. Um, another cause was to analyze and work against the influence of money and profit in the political uh, system. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, uh, addressing the education gap or the uh, access to education gap that we have in, uh, in the country. So thank you so much. I'm Lisa Hodgins, and I had Group B, and they are brilliant, funny, um, caring, full of empathy, and we talked about so many things. But we started out with, and I, I found this uh, to be the thing that we came back to over and over again, the title of uh, Rose Gladney's edition of Lillian Smith's letters, How Can I Be Heard? And, of course, that is a quotation from uh, Lillian Smith. And we had varieties of answers to that, and one of the major ones was, when should I be the listener, and when should I be the voice that is speaking? So when, uh, how can I be heard, we have to, to hear that uh, and also be able to listen. We went from that to um, fear, hopelessness. Uh, we told our stories, which I think uh, I can speak for the group, saying that that was a hopeful uh, way to discuss what the future can bring. We talk about whether groups can help or hurt. Are they polarizing? Uh, and of course, the answer to that is that groups can both help and hurt. And as Mary said, if we gave our, and uh, I think Imani, it may have been John, uh, if we gave our uh, whole being to one group where we felt like there could be transformation, that that could be life changing. And that led us into, well, what is the individual's responsibility? Okay. And transformation was one of the answers. But once you transform, and I think Dr. O'Keefe mentioned this, what do you do with that? You go, oh, I'm transformed, I have empathy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I care about other people, uh, that that is not going to um, change the world by itself, but it probably, transformation in our society, all of the inequalities, race, class, gender, the, all of the things we talked about, we have to be transformed first and then we act. So, um, we talked a little bit about what keeps us from acting, what keeps us, uh, and what keeps this uh, imbalance um, stuck, why do we, have good intentions and things seem to change and then they go back. And greed seemed to be the answer to that. Oh. <laughs> and that took us into, well, do, does politics have the answer? And, uh, or does religion have the answer? And each one of those, we're talking about us versus them, that polarization. There are so many other things that we talked about that is difficult. Uh, everybody in my group I was just articulate and brilliant, and we came to um, a conclusion by one of our undergraduate students at Piedmont who said he thought for change to occur, we have to have open dialogue. And then one of our other members said, yes, with open settings, there has to be a place for dialogue where we are listening and uh, where we're speaking uh, with our voice. And for the last thing, one person came up and said, you know, I just got more and more depressed as, <laughs> as our discussion went on. And I said, why? And he said, well, we've done these things. We've tried them. We've talked about them. And here we are. And then someone else was talking at the same time, saying, where was Gandhi in 1930? He was a lawyer sitting in his office. We don't know what will happen. And it can be wonderful, 
and will be wonderful and terrible, to <laughs> quote someone. But that was our group. It was great. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. I'm Megan Hoffman, and I teach psychology here at Piedmont College. Please forgive me. I had to make a series of notes on the talks that we had. I first want to thank everybody that was part of my group because you guys were so engaged and so empathic, and we really were able to generate a really trusting and open environment. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about was how the group members shared their own experiences, especially during um, civil rights changes in the 1960s, some of their own experiences with segregation and some of the really powerful emotions that they felt as a result of that. One thing we really grappled with was what Dr. Imani Perry talked about, uh, her call to young people to become engaged and to take social action. Um, we were trying to figure out what would be required in order to teach young people to do this or how to teach them best. And um, we were also influenced by um, Tim's point about empathy. Um, and we talked about that quite extensively. We talked about how um, we need to get young people re-sensitized to the world. We talked about um, how maybe social media and other things have driven people away from really connecting with things and have maybe blurred people's um, perceptions to what's happening in front of them. So we talked about resensitizing, um, making people empathic through empathy training and getting kids to uh, learn these sorts of things when they're in school in addition to knowledge and other sorts of skills. And we talked about um, the need for as many of our speakers have talked about, the need for changing our language in order to reflect this. And that involves talking about implicit biases instead of you know, overt racism, and um, thinking about the larger system that supports advantage for one group over another. Um, finally, I just wanted to reflect on, um, as a psychologist, you know, we study a lot about the individual and how the individual's feelings, thoughts, and actions are um, influenced by other individuals. But like a lot of people um, in American culture, we very much focus on the individual as this autonomous agent that can control their fate. And there's a, probably a lot of psychological reasons for that, right, that make us feel safe and secure. But one problem with that is it neglects the larger social and cultural structure that influences us. So um, we talked about how we need to return to that if we want to actually focus on real sociological change. So. Um, and focus our awareness and attention on the community, not just the individual, which um, is necessary. Thank you. I as well had a wonderful group, so thank you all for being awesome and for being so generous with your wisdom and your experiences. Unfortunately, my three colleagues stole all the interesting <laughs> insights that we came up with for the most part. So to echo everything that they said, um, it seemed that everything that we covered generally dealt with this tension between individual action and social action. What can we as individuals do in the experiences that we have, our interactions with other people? How can we influence those around us? The idea came up that, you know, if we're silent, it's not in the context of a society characterized by injustice. Silence isn't really not acting. It's actually supporting the status quo, which promotes more injustice, so what can we do as individual people while at the same time speaking as a sociologist, what is the architecture of this system? How is the system set up? How can we change policies which can then structure better experiences, more just experiences for everybody? The idea came up, well, to what extent is this system of racism connected to this system of capitalism, this legacy of colonialism, and how do these systems of injustice work together? The idea came up about the arts. Well, how can the arts play a role in social change? There are a lot of people like me who have literally mountains of evidence about injustice, but you don't really seem to see many people like us talking on the news stations about these issues. Perhaps the arts can be a more effective way to communicate these ideas with a broader audience. The idea came up again about young people. In some ways, we see these ideas change over time. What are kids today thinking? How have these issues started to get traction and how can we see more progress happening? While at the same time in a society characterized by segregation in terms of public space, in terms of where we go to school, where we go to pray, where we go to play, if we're not communicating with other young people, how do we ever understand 
their experiences and learn from them and then learn about ourselves from them. And finally, the idea came up of, well, what exactly are we doing now? We had a, a Piedmont student who represented young people today and talked about how wonderful the progress is and how really, how looking back, and I, I was born in 1980 and you grow up, you learn about some of these issues in history class, how could people have been okay with a system where really black people were there, white people were there, it was illegal? It's really disorienting to think about how could that have, like really, how could that have happened? And I think that that was a question that Lillian Smith thought about in a time when not many other people in her circle were thinking about it. And I think that's a question we should all think about. What is characterizing our experiences today that maybe the generation, two generations from now, will look back and say, that was okay? How could people have been okay with that? How could people have not stood up and spoken out about that? So what blind spots do we have? What other issues may characterize our experiences in terms of injustice? So thank you all very much. So now it's our turn, um, the word people. I love being here with CNN. It helps a professor from Piedmont College to be with CNN. So okay. I'm happy to be with my old friend, John Blake, again. And as I said, what, uh, what we have, um, the task we've been given is just to talk about a little bit about what we've heard and what we think about what we've heard from different perspectives in all kinds of ways. And you get to go first. Oh, OK. I didn't know that. Um, I think what stood out to me, um, you might have to help me here. I, I, I think about a little scripture from the New Testament, the parable of the mustard seed, uh -huh. and how seemingly small and significant acts can create astounding um, endings, like really dramatic endings. And how, you know, when we think about social change, we think about the importance, and rightly so, of you know marches, uh, political active activism. Um, but the stories that really stood out to me and affected me in the workshop were stories about people who said they changed because of experiences with other people. Um, people growing up, we had a, a, a gentleman in our group I was really curious about. He opened up and he said, uh, you know, my parents were racist, and yet he's here today. And I asked, like, well, how did that happen? And we talked about that. And, you know, he, he talked about um, teachers, uh, you know, people he met going to college. Um, there was another woman who talked about growing up uh, in a really racist environment and how you're exposed to things. And I think there was another woman who said, uh, when I asked, like, how did you change? And you just thought about it? And, um, but we're in a room full of people who teach, like yourself, and, and people who try to communicate with people. And I think it can be, at times, particularly when you hear so much about Ferguson, it can be kind of deflating. Like, when is this stuff going to go away? Am I making any difference? But you might not even know it at the time, but you're already making a difference. There might be a student there, somebody in your midst who's hearing something or seeing something you're saying, and you're planning something in them. And it ripens in the future, and they've changed. You know, they can come from a family that's going in one direction, but they break that, that, that arc, and they become somebody else. And it's all small. It's not a march. It's not a book. But yet, it's still profound. And that's the thing that stands out to me. That's all. And I'm going to do mine, and then if you get another, you come okay. back in, OK? OK. We didn't, we, and today has just been a wonderful demonstration of how when you get brilliant people in the room together, it just all flows. And I'm talking about every single one of you. Um, I listen carefully all day long. And if I um, went one, two, three, then in the first hour, I was incredibly struck as Jane Kidd, Tommy Brown, and Don Johnson talked, first of all, about the electrifying power of first-person narrative the you were there kind of sense you get talking to people. The second insight, though, was how often I think the headlines lull us into thinking the worst things happen somewhere else. And yet in that trio of storytelling, it was clear that the trouble is not all in New York or Ferguson yeah. or um, in Florida. It is in Athens and in the county next door. But you know, more than that, it's at the Dairy Queen and the Washeteria and the filling station and the county courthouse. And it isn't there but here, which means nobody's off the hook. And everyone is called, I think, to responsibility for stepping into the narratives that are dominant in our own localities 
to um, be part of shifting those narratives so that the, the storytelling happens before the awful things happen. And with any grace and luck, there are fewer horrible things to talk about when it's too late. So I, I got that from the first hour. And while I was talking to, to, while I was listening to John, the main thing I wrote down was we have to ask our parents to tell us their stories. And we have to tell our children our stories, especially the painful ones. That's the, one of the main things I took away from your talk, is how astonishing that the stories weren't told. But I also heard you redefine racism in a way that mattered to me, to define it as systems of advantage based on race. And when I think about that again, locally in my own county, what difference might it make to become aware of those before they ripen into acts of violence? Um, what systems of advantage based on race, and I might extend that to um, ethnicity um, or country of origin where I live, but that was hugely important. Um, and the third hour, listening to Dr. Perry, I teach world religions, so I thought about a site um, that is hosted by uh, mostly Muslims, and it's called Change the Story. Change the Story. It's, it's now been handed over, but as I listen to her, not only do we get over our fear of talking about race, but we also um, pay attention to the inherited stories we receive that reinforce our biases and strive to be the tellers and listeners of more accurate stories. I call them counter stories that thump some of that inherited, quote, knowledge in the head um, so that we can become, in her words, ill-adjusted to the status quo. Don't you love that? The goal is not to become well-adjusted, but perhaps more ill-adjusted to the status quo. Um, so those are among the many things I heard today, but the theme that knit everything together is that storytelling is and can be a way of reimagining the world not only of inheriting the old wisdom with its blessings and its biases, but it is through the stories we tell and perhaps even more the stories we're willing to be part of that we reimagine the world so that the stories the next generation inherits are richer and um, broader than the stories we got. So our final session today makes clear today we've begun a conversation. We have not finished one, though we will not meet like this again. And in fact, I'd flip a comment I heard earlier, which is all these terrible things are, are going on, and here we are. I'd say all these terrible things are going on, and here we are. <laughs> so I hope that after today, something catches your attention tomorrow, something you are tempted to be despairing about, uh, something shows up that gives you an opportunity to get a hold of it with your teeth instead of only um, going into the, the waves with it. But I, I hope that today, with all the different speakers and storytelling that you've heard, that there's something you can't ignore tomorrow, and that Monday there's something that you're curious about getting involved in for the first time, even if it's being the only you in the room, the only kind of you in the room. I loved that challenge earlier. Um, but you have all been wonderful to give this time today to this. We're going to ask Craig Amison to wrap up in a moment, but not without me thanking you for your time, counting on your finding ways locally to respond to what you've heard, and especially to thank John Blake for being here all day long, and Terry Lynn as well. Thank you. Again, thank you all for being here today. I hope that the stories um, we've heard and shared today have made an impact and that we will be inspired by these words from Lillian Smith. If we realize the need for change, if we want to change, we can change. In the months and years ahead, Piedmont College will be hosting symposia and other events through the Lillian E. Smith Center, close to home and in other locations, and we hope we can count on your support of and participation in these programs. Safe travels and take care. Thank you.